Hey guys, thanks for joining me. In today's episode, we will be looking at the post tensioning that was uh, designed for the FIU pedestrian bridge. We're going to look at uh, how the post tensioning was done, look at the different types of post tensioning methods that were used, and try to make sense of where a mistake may have been made and focus on why post tensioning was selected at all for this bridge because that is really what makes this bridge unique is the fact that post tensioning was implemented everywhere and that seems to be the most critical component of this bridge and why the bridge may have failed and we know at the time of failure that a, con a worker was st doing some type of work to a post tensioning bar uh, when the bridge collapsed so that's going to be our focus now before we get started I'd like to thank you for joining me again I think I'm at about 136 subscribers so to each and every one of you I'd like to thank you for signing up I really appreciate it um, getting a lot of feedback uh, a lot of views on the uh, my, la my last video which was about the debunking of the um, some of the myths that are out there and I'd like to thank you for for just continuing to watch the video series and and staying involved and leaving comments and feedback and you guys are just really making it interesting and uh it keeps me keeps me interested as well so thanks for joining me now my focus here is going to let's start with basically what post tensioning is and why do we use it so post tensioning we use it because concrete is not a strong material when it is in tension and that's pretty that's just a that's a fact concrete is primarily useful in compression so if i if i squeeze concrete if i if i step on it if i apply a compression into that concrete that's really what it is best that's that's the the force that it can handle best now we in order to to account for that fact that concrete can only really handle compression well, we need to add steel. So typically, the traditional way of uh, having a concrete member have tension strength, tensile strength, would be uh, we would add rebar, a reinforcement, steel reinforcement. You see it everywhere. You see it in basically anywhere you go. You see it in sidewalks. You see it in columns in a building. You see it. Uh, everywhere parking garages anything that's made out of concrete will have some type of steel reinforcement in it e even if it's just for controlling cracks you need to have some sort of steel reinforcement in it that's that's just how it is so in any traditional reinforced concrete you're going to see you're going to have steel re reinforcement steel you'll, you'll hear, hear referred to as steel rebar uh, and that's all referring to uh, the steel that's in the concrete now in this case, we had, so that's the traditional way. In this case, we had steel, the concrete was really dependent upon a uh, post-tensioning, which what that does is that introduces compression into concrete so that the concrete never should experience any tensile stresses. Um, and that's, 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 the, that's huge because... The concrete, if it's always going to be in compression, you shouldn't have any cracks. And that, that's what post-tensioning does. It introduces compression into the member, and so that member should ne that concrete should never see any tension stresses, so it should never crack. And so that, that makes uh, concrete a much stiffer uh, member when it's in when it's being post-tensioned or pre-stressed. There's different ways of of adding compression into the member as previously discussed there's you can uh, post tension a member a concrete member you can use a strand so in this case in this bridge they used two different f types of uh, ways of post tensioning they use strands these strands these this is a half inch diameter strand they used a, a little bit larger strand but it's the same principle this strand was used in the deck and also in the top cord so lots of these strands were were used in the deck they went 
in the transverse and in the longitudinal direction and also in the top from what the drawings show it's only showing a longitudinal uh, strands but I believe they might have had also transverse strands because of the uh, the cantilever of the canopy on the uh, top cord here so strands were used in the bottom and top cord to post tension and the diagonal member and the diagonals they used a different form of steel for post tension they used bars one and three quarter inch diameter bars and this is approximately what was used this is a little bit smaller but this is an example of a post tensioning bar and what it would look like this is about a one and a half inch diameter all thread uh, bar so in the diagonal members this is what they used all right so they used two different two different methods of post tensioning Focusing on the post tensioning of the diagonal truss members because that's where the failure occurred. We know that member 11 was being post tensioned. It was conflicting accounts. Some accounts say that the bar in member 11 was being tensioned when the bridge collapsed. Other reports say that the bar was being detensioned. So that's going to have to be determined by the NTSB investigation seems logical that the bar in order for that member to have failed that they would have been tensioning the uh, post tensioning bar but it's it's not clear why they would have been doing that so that's all going to be part of the investigation results but in, in either case if looking at how the post tensioning work is done this bar is inserted this bar is inside of a duct that runs the full length of the diagonal. All right, then each each truss member had two shown here in this cross section of the diagonals. Each bar, each truss member had two or more in the diagonal that failed, it had two post tensioning bars. Okay, 1 and 3 quarter inch diameter. Now, the way these bars are tensioned is the concrete is poured and cured and then these bars are after the concrete is cured these bars are tensioned and the way they're tensioned is they use hydraulic jacks and I am going to show you in this sketch here this is an excerpt from Williams engineering group but this is online I'll, I'll provide a link in the description uh, this is their system it's a proprietary system not necessarily what was used but it's similar to what's shown on the design drawing so that's why I'm referring to this this uh, Williams system what what you have is you have a, a plastic duct and I'm not going to go into all the detail here but basically you have a plastic duct you have your one and three quarter inch bar in that plastic duct and then at the ends of the duct you have a what anchors the the bar is you have a square washer and then you have a nut and here's my nut and this is I have a round washer but it's principally in principle it's the same okay so this square washer and this in my case a round nut is what would hold the ank would anchor the end of the threaded bar and this nut is is what would be uh, locking in the tension all right now the tension is created by a jack that pulls the end of the bar so the end of my bar this is the end of my bar this exposed end here is pulled by a jack in this case looking at the again Williams their post tensioning system they have a what's called a T80 post tension hydraulic jack so this jack is similar to what's shown at the site of the collapse of the the jack that was used at on member 11 when the bridge failed this type of jack is what you would put on the end of this bar and you would have a bunch of uh, rubber hoses running to the to the jack to to create the pressure that's going to pull 
uh, the piston that pulls this this bar but that jack is pulling on that bar the other end of this, uh, of this post tensioning bar is is locked in place I lost my light and when you're jacking you have a pressure gauge that is showing you the pressure readings that are inside of what's called a ram this this is what's pulling on the bar so you you look at the pressure and that pressure is supposed to correspond with a tension force in the bar all right so to recap your bar your threaded rod is tensioned by a hydraulic jack which is hooked up to gauges that monitors the pressure in the jack that tells you how much tension is being applied that end of the rod is stretched by the jack when the correct stretch is is when you reach the correct stretch this nut is tightened down it's tightened down and it locks in the tension so now when you lock in the tension you can release the jack and the tension is converted into the compression of the member so that's how you achieve a post tensioning of a member in this case the diagonal members were post tensioned using this method okay now what what's what I want to show you next is how how much stretch needs to be performed in order to achieve the correct post tensioning amount we know from the drawings again preliminary drawings not final drawings used in construction but these are preliminary design drawings but we're gonna these are pretty accurate these are pretty good drawings actually so if we look at the at the post tensioning forces they're all around 200 kips all right we know a one and three quarter inch diameter bar can can approximately take 400 kips of tension before it fails so we're going to about half of its potential half of its ultimate strength when we stretch to 200 kips in tension all right so to get to 200 kips in tension you have to stretch this bar by a certain amount and that's what I'm going to show you next one of the basic properties of really any material is what's called a modulus of elasticity I'm not going to get too technical here guys so I'm going to keep it real basic but this is really a very basic principle that applies to all materials basically all materials have this property which is a modulus of elasticity which basically what it means is that every material whether it's steel whether it's concrete whether it's wood whether it's plastic they all have this modulus of elasticity which I'm just gonna call it as an E I'm gonna represent it as an E that what that means is that every every material behaves sort of like a rubber band alright if you know how much force you apply into this rubber band you can determine how much stretch you're gonna see how much deformation is gonna occur so and then and if you release that force that material will return to its original configuration to its original length so that's what this modulus of elasticity represents and that is a very basic property and I, I, I want to make sure you that's that's clear because that is really key so steel has a very high modulus of elasticity its value is approximately depending on the, the type of steel you're using but it's usually around this ballpark of 29,000 KSI 29,000 kips per square inch alright so that's that's a basic property of steel what this modulus of elasticity means is that if I know how much stress I'm applying so basically how much force I'm applying into a steel member I can figure out how much it stretches so this 29,000 KSI represents what's known as stress divided by strain stress is a force over an area strain is a change in length so if I know my stress 
and I know my modulus, I can figure out my strain. So in this case, we had a one and three quarter inch diameter bar. A one and three quarter inch diameter all thread bar has an area of 2.4 square inches. We also know that a tension of 200 kips was applied to each post tensioning bar, approximately. All right, so if we know these two values, we can determine the stress, this, this part of the, of the equation. All right, so stress here is going to be is going to be your tension force divided by your area. And that is 200 kips divided by 2.4 square inches. All right, that's all it is. That's stress. And that is 83.3 KSI. And I'm just going to round that up to 84 KSI. Because this is my channel and that's what I feel like doing right now. All right. 84 KSI is your stress. We know your modulus. This is a constant value. This is a given. You, you don't have to calculate this number. This is provided. It's just a bacterial property. This is 29 KSI for 29,000 KSI for steel. We know your stress because we know the post tensioning force and we know the area of the bar. 84 KSI. Strain is what we want to figure out. And the reason I want to figure out strain is I want to show you how much these bars, this one and three quarter inch diameter bar, had to be stretched in order to achieve its 200 kip specified tension. All right, so we're going to figure out strain. Strain is, we're going to reconfigure this equation. Strain is equal to stress. Basic algebra, guys, I'm not trying to overwhelm you with math here, but I do want to get the point across, and this is important if, in order for you to understand how things work in the field. Stress over your modulus of elasticity, which is 29,000 KSI, that is your strain equation and we know stress is 84 KSI so 84 KSI over 29,000 KSI gives you a strain of 0 0.00287 what strain represents is how much the material length changes when I apply 83.3 KSI to a 1 and 3 quarter inch diameter bar this strain is represented by strain is represented by a change in length over total length. In this case, member 11, the diagonal member that failed, represented here. This is member number 11. We know that Top cord is about 20 feet. This vertical here was about 15 feet. So this is the end of the truss. I'm, I'm skipping a few steps here, guys. But if you watch my previous videos, you'll see these dimensions. 15 feet, 20 feet. Member 11 is approximately 25 feet long. All right. So if I take this 25 feet and I plug it into this equation and I know my strain, I can figure out the change in the length. So if I change in, change in the length is equal to strain times the length of the member, which is equal to 0 0.00287, which is my strain, times the length of the member, which is 25 feet, approximately, member number 11. And that is equal to 0 0.0718 feet, which is equivalent to 0 0.861 inches. All right, so we're through with the math. 0 0.0861 inches. What does 0 0.0861 inches mean? That means that this, this bar, one and three quarter inch diameter bar, in order for it to reach a 200 kip tension, has to be stretched by less than one inch. Less than one inch, guys. I mean, 
that. That's all this bar is being stretched. All right, it's not being stretched much. Now, we mentioned that in order for this bar, if you want to fail this bar, it can go to as high as 400 kips of tension. So, if in order for me to get to 400 kips of tension, I need to double that, double that length because this is 0.861 gets me to 200 kips. If I double that, I'm at one and three quarter inches approximately before my bar fails. So this fails if I stretch it to one and three quarter inch diameter, which is not a lot. It's it it doesn't seem like a, a big distance to me, right? One and three quarter inches, and then this bar fails. Now, the that's a small amount because this is such a big bar and this bar to in order to stretch it even like even a remote half of an inch a very small amount you need a big force but the point of this is to show you that in the field in order to accurately stress tension your post tensioning bars you are not looking at large amounts of elongation in the bar all right so if you are not paying attention or if the jack is giving you misinformation in the pressure gauge or if you're just not monitoring it closely, you could easily mess up your tensioning of the bar. All right, so that's important. One other point I did want to mention, in addition to the jacks stretching the bars, I did want to mention the fact that there are losses involved with post tensioning. What do I mean by losses? I mean that when you stretch your bar with the jack and then you release the jack so that the force now is being transferred into the concrete. So the jack is released, this bar has been stretched it is going to lose some stretch because there is some loss in the tension that was being applied by the jack because this is going to there's going to be some amount of what I'll call settlement basically the the everything needs to be equalized and this nut will move a little bit so you will lose some tension in the bar after the jack is released and that's also important that's con that's considered when you are when you are calculating how much you need to stress how much you need to tension your bar with the jack that should all be calculated in advance but when i when i mentioned 0.861 to tension it to 200 kips you really want to go a little bit beyond that in order to account for those uh, settlement losses that displacement loss that will occur once you release the jack so in this case they may have wanted to stretch it to about an inch maybe a little bit more than an inch in order to account for uh, losses that occur after releasing of the jacks and uh, again the point of this is to, to show you that when looking at the bars now this is only for bars cables the strands when they're post tension that's that's a different animal because these can stretch more and you have you're you're not looking at uh, fractions of an inch when you're uh, post tensioning a, a strand it's different this is a different animal but when you're looking at the bars which is what was being done when the member 11 failed they were being uh, tensioned when you're looking at bars that are this big one and three quarter inch diameter bar this is this is this is a, a serious piece of steel this is a uh, you're looking at really small amounts of of uh, elongation of the member when you're jacking and that's how you when you're doing the jacking in the field in addition to monitoring the pressure gauge you should be monitoring how much your bar is elongating in order to verify that you're properly jacking it because there are a bunch of factors that could affect whether you're uh, you're actually when you're reading this pressure gauge whether that is actually corresponding to how much you're stretching the bar because there are friction the, the the bar could be rubbing against the side of the pipe that it's in the duct and that could be preventing it from stretching so there's a bunch of things that you need to be looking for when you're doing your your tensioning operation and and that's that's important so when this work was being done it seems like there was only one guy maybe maybe another helper out there 
But really, it seems like there was just one or two guys on the bridge when they were doing the post tensioning of member number 11, they were tensioning or post or releasing tension on these bars. Now, if they were releasing the tension on these bars when the bridge failed, that would have meant that they would have had to pull this bar in order for the nut to be loosened. Okay, so we mentioned tensioning the bars. So you tension the bars, you pull the bar with a jack, and then you turn the nut clockwise. You turn it uh, righty-tighty, right, to lock, the, to jam that nut into position against the, the, the washer, and that locks in the tension. If they had been detensioning it, they would have done a similar operation with the jacking. You want to jack it just enough to relieve the tension that's being locked in by the nut. You relieve that tension, and now you can spin the nut lefty, lefty-loosey. You can spin it counterclockwise to remove that tension, and so when the jack is released, that this bar, the tension is, is either reduced or removed completely. So I hope that helps you guys understand the post-tensioning. I ho I've hoped I've explained it well enough. If I haven't, please let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll be able to answer it better in writing. But that's how post-tensioning works. That's why it's, it's a really sensitive operation. You can see you're looking at really small, small amounts of stretch in the bars that were used. And it's a sensitive operation. And, I, and it is why this bridge, it's why this bridge may have failed because of the post-tensioning. At, at least at the time of collapse, that's what was happening. And, uh, and it is why this bridge was able to even be designed as a concrete bridge because without the post-tensioning, this bridge would not have ever been able to stand as, as a just a sim as a reinforced unpost-tensioned uh, bridge because of the it would have you would have needed so much concrete and so much steel reinforcement it would have been even heavier than it was at 950 tons as a post-tensioned bridge so if that makes sense guys let me know if it doesn't ask me questions I'll 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 answer them as you leave your feedback in the comments section I'll link to you I'll link for you this uh this information from Williams it's really good they're uh they're online. It's it's good information. It seems to be what's very similar to what's shown on the drawings. Whether it was what was used in the field or not, who knows? But it's it is very similar to what they show in the drawings, and uh, and this information is, is accurate. They show you uh, different uh, bar sizes and the and the properties of the uh, the different uh, nuts and the washers that may have been used, and also the jacking information. The jack information is provided. So I'll link that for you in the description. Let me know you have if you have any comments or feedback, and uh, I hope to uh, hope to see you again down the road as uh, I put out the next few videos in this series. Thanks again. Talk to you later, guys. Bye.